Yes. Who is that you're having? What? Who is that in your this, arm? This is Stella. Oh, ah, okay. I did not recognize her. Okay. Okay. She doesn't have to speak. She doesn't have to speak. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Great Tree Zen Women's Temple. This morning, our speaker is Lillian Pepin from France and a longtime member of our Sangha. But first, a short statement on Dhamma. In Buddhism, when Zen practitioners share their understanding of the teachings and practice, it is offered freely as a practice of Dhamma Paramita. Dhamma is a Pali word that means generosity or to give freely. And this practice is done without expectation of getting something in return. This is the spirit about talking about Dharma. Other ways to practice Dhamma is to offer support to those who share the teachings, to support places of spiritual practice, and to give without judgment or expectation when opportunity arises. Those who share the teachings at Great Tree do so on a Dhamma basis. Please support their practice by giving what you can. Lillian, where would you like your Dhamma to go? Uh, Great Tree. Great Tree. That would be at Great Tree temple.org and follow the donate path. Can you make a line? Mm. I put it up, but maybe it's not going on. Good. Yeah, thank you. We're fixing the line. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we've got um, Dr. Lillian Muir and Papin here, breathing the fog, walking in the fog, lung and colon health challenges. And Lillian is a Franco-American writer and teacher of Chinese medicine, which she describes as an ecological medicine, particularly suited to our times. She practices and teaches acupuncture, herbology, qigong, and dietary therapy. Thanks for being with us this and morning. Lillian, can I ask you a question? You know that book that you wrote and that was getting translated? Is that available in English now? Not yet, not yet, no. Yeah. Need to work on it, need to work on it. I'm finishing a third one here in French, but after that, I will focus on translation. Okay, thank you. I saw it in French and it was amazing. What? I was asking she wanted tea. All right. So thank you very much for coming. Um, you were just here recently, so I've I'm really grateful that you that you come back, and uh, I I really appreciate um, having the kind of body awareness that you uh, offer. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tejo. And I'm also very uh, touched when I heard you know she's part of our sangha. It really uh, means a lot to me uh, being in France to know that I'm part of the sangha. And that Pepito was on your altar. Yes, still is, 49 days. Yes, I know I'm doing it too. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm counting the days. Thank you so much. And uh, okay, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, I did a little uh, presentation. That's my, maybe my weakness. I like to have that support. So, um, let me know if there is any problem. And let's see. There we go. And we're going to go. Hold on just one second. Slideshow. Right. And play from the start. As synchronicity would have it, of course. I was doing some work um, for other teaching. I mean, for my the, the the training I'm doing in the Chinese medicine for some students, and the topic was grief in the fall. And um, well, here I am, and I experienced it. All right.
right. So I'm going to start talking about the month of November. One thing I'm doing for myself and with my students too, is every month to look at the energy of the, the upcoming months, because I realized, and I mentioned that last time I was with you, that we tend to, you know, to go through the months without paying too much attention. Of course, in November, in the US, you have Thanksgiving. So that's a big one. And so it does mark the months. But uh, other than those big, uh, um, big uh, marks on, on time, we, we tend to go through months without looking at them too closely. And really, each one of them has a specific energy. And of course, it's always good. And I know in, at Great you do that, you know, celebrate full moon, which is November 27th. So it will be after Thanksgiving. New is November 13th. So it's in just two days. And the astrological signs are Scorpio and Sagittarius. Not that I know so much about astrology, but I, like I wrote on this, um, on this side, doctors and therapists talk about November as um, the a month of anguish, a month of anxiety, and of seasonal depression kicking in. And I thought it's interesting because even the sign Scorpio. Uh, for many people, it's kind of, you know, not, not a great sign, which of course has nothing to do with reality. It's a projection that we have, but November, Scorpio, there's kind of a somber um, mood about that. And of course, it's part of the fall. And I don't know what weather you have like, but certainly this year, like I said, that synchronicity, I was talking about grief and it's like, News, of course, war, that's certainly a cause of grief. Um, and it's it's really terrible right now. And then um, here the weather is also terribly gray and um, rainy, 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 rainy to the point of flooding in many areas. So there's definitely all the November uh, type of um, atmosphere, let's say. October is a little bit different, right? October, we leave, we enter the fall, there's something softer about uh, October. But November um, is very often, November, December, we try to escape. And I think some of the celebrations actually are a way to escape the the, the the moodiness or the heaviness of the month. So, and of course, there's November 11, which is today. Um, it's Veterans Day in the US, but in France, it's it's maybe more important uh, in the in the collective psyche, the end of World War One, uh, which was. Uh, really um, a terrible war. And you can say that in France, the end of the war, of the First World War, marked the end of, of the countryside life. Because so many young men were killed during the war that the families could not continue farming and you know women were left to 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 work alone so there was a huge exodus and you the countryside lost more than half of of its people uh after first world war and so it really changed um the the life uh, of france and families i realized through some of the writings of my students, how families have been so heavily marked by those wars, First and Second World War, and, you know, grandparents, and so much trauma has been transmitted uh, from those wars that is still hunting, and you will see that it's very appropriate to talk about hunting, still hunting the psyche 
um, of modern people, you know, through the traumas inherited from those. Like, just to give you a couple of examples, one uh, student wrote, um, you know, when when my grandfather came back from uh, the war, um, he was totally changed. And from the happy-go-lucky man he was, he was somebody who didn't speak anymore and started drinking heavily and it destroyed the family. And that's just one story. So I think sometimes it's good um, to, I mean, it's good to remember and that's part of our lineage and that's part of the reality that we're dealing with. And so I know in the US, the memories are a little bit different, although many people did die also um, in a, in the war, but less so than First World War. And I'm saying that because November 11 is, a, is an off day and everybody uh, goes to the cemetery a bit like All Saints Day. And so with November, as we are, we are more deeply into the tunnel, so to speak, of the fall. Of course, it opened with Halloween on October 31st, and then November 1st was All Saints Day. And it's interesting in All Saints Day, which was a huge celebration. And again, please forgive me, I talk more about France because I'm more used to the traditions in France. That's where I grew up. but. Um, I remember my parents going to the cemetery on All Saints Day and uh, bringing flowers and so on. But today, if you go to the internet to check on the internet All Saints Day and see how it's doing in the Catholic tradition, well, all you find is destinations for holidays, you know, because it's become a holiday, a school holiday. And really, there's no information about All Saints Day and the tradition. It's all, you know, like go there and it's cheap there and why don't you escape? And so um, my comment about that, which goes with what I'm looking at with the fall, is that we tend to want to escape those sad times or uh, and the, the, the awareness of death. Uh, even though in our tradition it's there, of course, Halloween is nothing but that, even though it's become a bit crazy. Mm -hmm. And then in Mexico, the Dio Dia de los Muertos, which is during the first days of November, which the UNESCO has called a immaterial cultural, cultural, cultural heritage. And it's really very widely celebrated in Mexico, and they take it very seriously. <clears throat> and you do altars in your home and, and offerings in your home. So it's all there, right? All over the world, you look at the Jewish tradition of uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is sometimes in November, sometimes end of October. Um, you have always that awareness of death hovering because that's where nature yeah. is too. Right, and so in Chinese medicine, um, I would say in Taoist tradition, the emotions linked to the season of the lung, which is the fall, is uh, grief and sadness. Not, and sometimes it is said that those are the negative emotions, but I don't believe that they are negative. They are, you know, it's like, yes, when you have countries going through grief, when you have um, when you have a lot, you go through grief, and there's nothing to judge or to repress or to uh, to push away about that. But it does have a reality, and it does have an effect on what we experience and our health. So. Um, here too, I'm not sure about the US how it is, but in um in France, chrysanthemum is a flower that you bring to the cemetery. And the symbolism of the chrysanthemum in France and in in Japan or China is very different. Meaning here you enjoy chrysanthemum, you think it's beautiful flowers, 
And you can tell me maybe because I'm less aware of what it's like in the US, but you would not offer chrysanthemum to someone because, you know, it's death, it's cemetery, it's sad, which is very different in, in Japan because November is also month of chrysanthemum and which is just the opposite, meaning that it's a, uh, and it's a very serious uh, celebration. I gave you a few pictures, you know, temples are decorated with uh, chrysanthemum and there are lots of festivals of chrysanthemum. You see people even dress, you know, dress up with chrysanthemum and huge festivals. So it's a revered flower. And you are, um, I mean, you would offer it, you know, you do offer it. And it's a flower that's yeah. a symbol of joy because of the colors vibrancy. It's a symbol of longevity because it's a flower that lasts, you know, into the cold, it's revered for its beauty and also a symbol of resistance. And meaning that we do need, and I'd like to touch on that a bit more maybe uh, this time, how flowers, plants, they have a spirit and we can learn from them. So the teaching of the chrysanthemum is, you know, in a way how to strengthen your immunity, your resistance. It's a symbol of happiness meaning ma um, managing to find flower and beauty when it's cold and dreary sometimes outside or most of the time, <laughs> because in the North, November in Japan is also pretty dreary. It's a symbol of vitality and it's both a festive and medicinal plant. So, in the Orient, you make tea and wine from chrysanthemum. And I'm going to talk about that because it's something to take advantage of. Here again, some, you know, some celebrations of chrysanthemum. And the chrysanthemum is talked about in the first herbal treaty that was written in the second century after Christ in, in China, is described as an aromatic sweet, bitter, and cool flower, meaning it has aromatic means it helps with sinuses, cool meaning it can help with fever, and it helps your lung and your liver. So because of that, I'm not going to go too much into detail. You're not, uh, we're not into Chinese medicine um, study, but it is, uh, uh, it's good to know that it's a flower that's really good for cough. There's a famous remedy that is used for children that's called uh, Sang Ju Yin, and Ju means Ju Hua, which is chrysanthemum. Ju Hua is the name in Chinese. So it's good for eyes, like, you know, red eyes, irritated eyes. And so it is said that it clears the liver. It's a good liver cleansing herb or flower. It comes excess liver young. So, you know, anything like uh, when we are rushed, when there's a tendency to hypertension or hyperactivity, that's what we call liver young. And so chrysanthemum is a plant that is good for that. And modern phar pharmacology says that it dilates blood vessels and inhibits staphylococcus. So if you have the beginning of a cough, the beginning of a cold, the beginning of a flu, or even a flu, uh, you know, full blown, you can make a chrysanthemum tea, or if you're sick already, you will make a decoction, meaning cook it longer, you know, on a low flame, and it will soothe the lung and the liver. So it is said that the yellow flower is better as helping with wind uh, heat, so cold and uh, uh, fever and uh, you know all the signs of a flu. When the white one 
is better for that hyperactive mind. And especially the round ones, you know, the, the ones called snowball chrysanthemum, they are very um, uh, bushy, very tight, uh, and they're the best. And the most powerful of all is the wild um, chrysanthemum. So I'm mentioning that because chrysanthemum is certainly a way to, let's say, share in the spirit of the plant and the spirit of the fall and to deal with some of the symptoms that can accompany a difficult time for humans. You know, many people do fall sick. Uh, you know, there's a tiredness into the, the winter. So it's a great ally to know. And um, that's the spirit of chrysanthemum that can be very helpful. So by all means, enjoy chrysanthemum tea, which is very common in, uh, in China or in Japan after a meal. And can be either as an, an infusion for just a digestive tea. It's in the same family as uh, the chamomile, but it's stronger than chamomile. If you notice in the garden, the chamomile doesn't last that long. It doesn't have quite the resistance of the chrysanthemum, but it's in the same family. Huh? So what you can do uh, is, like I said, infusion or decoction. Like here is an infusion with some goji berries. Here is a snowball chrysanthemum. Uh, you can use other herbs like cinnamon or ginger. And it will relax the mind, promote deep relaxation. So that's a bit like our chamomile. Boost immunity, help the digestive system, like our chamomile too. Improve eyesight, especially, you know, dry eyes and uh, uh, sticky eyes or irritated eyes. It dissipates the first symptoms of a cold, supports heart functions. Great for a clear and radiant complexion. It is said that the empresses in China enjoyed chrysanthemum tea and it reinforces the bone system. And our science shows, you know, through chemical um, analysis that indeed it is good for all of that. But what to me is of interest in, in my own um, speaking, let's say, is to see that you know, that beautiful um, unity, meaning plants, they have, you know, they go through the same hardships as we do. And if we observe them, we can find their spirit. It's not like a spirit of a plant is something that strange. If you look, you can see it. Huh? And so look at that hardy snowball um, chrysanthemum that blooms in November and can last very long. And so, of course, it's a sign of resistance. So similar things we can enjoy, the spirit of November and the fall, is look at how well protected walnuts are, you know? And you make rice with walnut, for example, it's absolutely delicious. And walnut is strengthen the immune system. Nuts in general, acorn, we don't use acorn so much anymore, but in the old days, and I'm looking, saying very old days in Celtic tradition, they would make flour from acorns and make many dishes from acorns. And then later in the Middle Ages, it was given to the pigs because people forgot how to use it. So I don't know if some people are interested in checking into that, but it's a great source of many benefits, including protein. It comes from the oak tree, so very resistant also. Pumpkin, squash, of course. And again, rice cooked with pumpkin is delicious. Uh, um, uh, Stuffed pumpkin is also delicious and you can stuff it with so many, many things. Uh, sweet potato is also in that same spirit. Mushrooms, which, you know, they thrive in the fall. And so the best way, again, is to go to the markets and see what 
local producers can uh, show us and tell us about what grows in our gardens at this time of year. And the plants that thrive in the fog and can help us in the fall. And it, you know, we, I mean, in a physical way, but in Chinese medicine, we never separate the physical way from the mental way. So we find aromatic herbs. For example, right now we have sage in our garden. That's just beautiful. And it's like the cold it welcomes the cold, it's, uh, and you can make great tree, a uh, great tree, <laughs> yes, <laughs> great tea, uh, thyme, basil, mint, ginger, cumin, cinnamon, all of those that are aromatic will help um, the digestion, but also open sinuses. So thyme is a great plant in the fall. Huh? And so it has both a physical aspect of digestion and the subtle aspect through smell. And notice how those are plants we use also in fumigation to disperse humidity and the mucus of places. That's the origin of incense, to clear the humidity and the heaviness of mucusy heaviness of humidity. All flowers like chrysanthemum, lavender, rose, geranium, of course, those mostly will be dried, but some of them like chrysanthemum, we've just seen. And of course, you have trees like pine, cedar, cypress are great allies to make tea decoctions. So if you have nothing else, you know, and you're in the forest and you have pines and you fall sick, well, you make a decoction of pine needles. And if we look, if we pay attention, we can guess from the way they grow what will be good for us. So roots, for example, are really good to give um, a strong energy. Uh, um, right, I put actually, this is a picture from our garden. The kale is also amazing. We planted our kale, and I'm sure Great Tree has some too. I know you had great kale there too. We planted ours last spring, and it did beautifully in the spring. It lasted all throughout the summer, and then we thought it was going to die because at the end of the summer it became kind of you know uh, there was not much left on the on the stems, and it had a regrowth, which is you know, typical of plants, it had a regrowth. And right now it's just wonderful. And actually when it's cold, the kale tends to become more delicate in, in, in flavor. So those are our allies, same as with, with resistant greens like kale and dive. And, you know, here it's called a curly lettuce. Uh, I think we you have that too. Uh, so again, talking to our local producers and see what what is going on in their gardens um, can be very helpful to to help us choose what is going to be helpful to us in this season. Give us the heartiness that is needed for the season. So, in terms of I already mentioned last time when we talked about the, the spleen, but all traditions say that the autumn is the thinnest veil between the, the visible and invisible world, meaning that it's a great time for subtler perceptions. And for that, we don't have to strive. We don't have to. It's just there. If we rest in the fog, if we accept the fog, and if we accept that there's a big mystery of death and life, which all of nature is talking about that right now. Um, and if we manage to, to uh, how to say, to espouse that energy, automatically we do have perceptions of that mysterious world because nature is whispering it to us. It's all there. We only have 
to open our eyes and to listen. And so it is said that fog comes up from the earth, rain and clouds come down. So it's the closest meeting between earth and heaven energy. And even more so in the fall than in winter, because winter is more clear. You know, the sky is a bit higher. So, but uh, the warmth that still emanates from the earth, you know, October, end of October is still there. So like here we had a couple of weeks ago, we had some storms, meaning the fighting between the two waves or the meeting between the waves of warmth and cold. In Japan, it's called Shimotsuki, which means month of frost. It's a month of meeting with ancestors in all traditions, in the Merindian uh, tradition. And in many traditions, you pray for the liberation of ghosts and suffering souls. <clears throat> and really, ghosts are... You know, ghosts are souls that did not quite end their journey or did not become aware. Like, you know, it is said that some soldiers continue to fight after death, you know, on, on a illusory uh, battlefield. So there is that completion, uh, that sense of ghosts, whether we believe in it or not, for sure there is a fascination with ghosts and notice that the countries that have the most ghost stories are also uh, countries, I think I mentioned that in the next one, we um, like Japan, because it's very, uh, you know, it's high mountains with heavy fog, Ireland, Scotland, and Carolyn Mills, whom you might uh, know, uh, relates a story of once being in Scotland and she says suddenly she saw a very white face going through the lobby and she turned around because it was so white that it caught her attention and she noticed there was nobody that it was just and so oh she was stunned and she told the the uh you know the the, the person at the at the welcome desk uh, she said, oh, my God, was this a ghost? And uh, the guy, uh, she says, said, uh-huh, not, you know, not phased in the least. And she said, what? Do you have ghosts here? Uh-huh, ma'am. So you mean that's real? It's a haunted place? Yes, ma'am. And she said he was really not even looking up from what he was doing. And um, she asked him more questions and he finally told her that the place had been at one point a hospital, but also before had been used as a prison during a Nazi occupation. And that there were, you know, a lot of stories about what might have happened. Um, like that. At the so, um, it is said that ghosts feed on thick fogs and yin energy. So, and again, we believe in it or not, the truth is we do have a fascination for ghosts, which, you know, it's seen in our movies. So we have the desire to pierce the veil, to understand the, you know, the mystery of life and death. And you know, the, whether we make it into um, a joke like with Halloween because we're not quite comfortable with it, it's definitely the fall calling our awareness to death and impermanence and the deep underlying anguish that there is about that. And um, ghosts represent in all stories, you know, murder stories and so on, the sense of what is not achieved, places of lingering trauma, what has not been completed. And I think that's a big teaching of the fall. So in, a, in, in a Chinese medicine, we talk about psychic mucus, you know, a thick mucus, and that mucus uh, is linked 
to um, delusion, to paranoia. Huh? Mucus means what is not digestive, digested, what lives inside and possesses a location, whether it's a place or a body, like in our lung, in our brain. So there's physical and psychic mucus. And of course, they go together because when you can notice that when we want to escape that sense of heaviness, we turn a lot towards food that actually do create mucus, heavy food. Um, sugar creates heavy mucus. Uh, dairy pro produces heavy mucus. Huh? So, and it makes emotions sticky and difficult to release, a bit like mud that, you know, will keep uh, things stuck and difficult to release too. Lung in Chinese medicine, which is the season of the, of the uh, associated with the fall season, is associated also, also with the colon. So the ability to release, the ability to complete the whole physical transit from food in the mouth to the anus and to have a complete uh, in-breath and literally out-breath completed in the colon. So physical mucus will translate into obesity, lung mucus, intestinal mucus, sinus mucus, bronchi, digestion. Notice how when our sinuses are, <clears throat> are clogged, we can't think clearly, right? So again, that's what to me is so precious about this old medicine is that there's no difference between psychic, uh, emotional, and physical. So nightmares, hallucinations, paranoia, delusion, addiction are all part of the same, same uh, journey. In Chinese medicine, I'm not going to go into that either, but in acupuncture, there are some points that we call ghost points and that we use to when people uh, express the feeling that they are being possessed, that they don't control, uh, or control is a, not a good word, but that they feel overwhelmed by their own emotions, by their own reactions, or I, you know, I don't recognize myself anymore. Of course, addiction is typical of that because the substance becomes the ghost and, you know, controls the body. So those are ghost points uh, for possession or today we could say for psychic uh, psychiatric disorders so our ghosts our fog again according to what we believe to what we co feel comfortable with we can see that there's an un underlying fascination and Caroline Miss said also very uh, rightly that it's terrible to hear you know when people um want to contact the other side how little they ask you know that's like oh I, I want to speak to the spirit of my father and then okay the psychic is gonna say you know in those shows yes he's here or he can what do you want to ask him and she said usually people just are you all right are you happy and nobody wants to ask what is the meaning of life do you know about that now over there how does it end? Where? How is it like over there? What is the other side like? Is morality important? Are ethics important? Is a good life important? How can we best complete our journey? And the fall brings up those questions. It's the end of the year. And so we need to think of what needs to be ended, even for that year. And um, I'd like to mention again from Caroline Mees, she talks, she talks about a ceremony done by the Inuit, uh, the Indians in the Arctic. And they have a ceremony called, called potlash from which potluck comes. And I'm not gonna go into details about that, but 
she met a woman who said that at the last ceremony of their potlash, a man had come who had said he could feel that his end was approaching, that death was approaching. And so when that was that, the whole tribe then would encourage and support the person into saying what needs to be said and was not said, that it's time to say. Um, to also, um, you know, what has not been finished, uh, resentments that are not finished, and do what needs to be done. And she said, if someone, for example, a potter is making pots, but knows he will not be able to finish the pots, then he has to designate somebody in the in the audience, in the in the tribe to whom he's gonna give his parts and ask him to finish them. Or if it's a songwriter, he gives songs and same, maybe to write some. So what I take from that, we can again adapt it in any way we like, but certainly the fall is a good time to think, you know, there's ghosts, Halloween and so on. What is haunting us? Are there any regrets? Is there any guilt? Is there any way we can free our ghosts? What kind of rituals can we do, which again can be so, so free, you know, like, uh, for example, with my little dog, I'm doing a ritual right now, which um, not only is the Tibetan ritual, but also I, I gave myself as a task to write a memory every day. I saw a man who drew a drawing every day for his dog, you know, because he felt so forlorn. And for me, I can't draw, but I can write. So every day I'm writing a memory. And we can do that with our loved ones, with the departed ones, we, however long we want. It can be one letter, it can be one week, whatever we want to offer, but it's not too late. And that's also the symbol of the ghosts. How are we going to get rid of our, that mucus and bring back memories? So it means facing death and our ghost. And the message of the fall is the importance of completion. We are nearing the end. What do we need to complete? And in terms of completing our breath, it's our abdominal breath, you know, breathing completely just like the colon completes the lung to breathe deep into our abdomen and complete our breathing. When we have anguish, where we are rushed, if we observe, we'll see that our breath gets stuck in our uh, breast, in our diaphragm. So breathing into the abdomen is a way of completing the breath. Oh, I see there's not that much time, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think you get the, the, the understanding that the spirit of the season, which articulates the end of life, the nearing of end. And again, young people also know that. Yeah, young people also experience death, whether it's a separation, losing a friend, moves, you know, moving from one part of the country to another one can be a huge event for a young person losing friends. So it's a, it's a time to remind us that already we have lost, that there's absence, regrets, and there's emptiness left behind. So how do we face that without resorting to artificial stimulation. That's the big, big, big challenge. And of course, we see that in Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, too much drinking, too much eating. Um, because we are not, you are, we are not skillful at handling that ending. It's a time of letting go. And it's a time that is chaotic in our emotions. And that's normal. The weather is chaotic. And grief is a chaotic emotion. It's not a pretty emotion. We have swollen eyes, runny nose, 
it's noisy, you know, like the mourners in the Arab countries. Mm -hmm. It's both a unique, very unique, nobody can share in someone's grief. And at the same time, it's universal. And we all share it. It's normal because we all know grief. And it's totally abnormal when it hits us. And we say in Chinese medicine that tears are the secretion of the liver to soften the metal of the lung. Though, and in our world right now, I think we need to be aware that grief, death, and chaos are somehow taboo, not quite politically correct. Um, it's, it's becoming a rare event to be able to accompany someone completely until the very end. When people die at the hospital, which is by, you know, by far the most common today, you know, we have sometimes one hour to grieve with the, the, the body. And then we see, when we see that body again, it's been prepared. Um, when I lost my sister a few years ago, when I saw her, you know, she had been made up and everything. And I had just 10 minutes, 15 minutes with her. And, you know, it's very different from the time of mourning that we had and um, that we can have. Like, I I did have that with my little dog, you know, and uh, for, through different circumstances, I we happened to do the old way, a three-day morning time, which was the usual time. And now it's not so frequent. And so we are very unskilled that's all we can say and that we need to relearn all of that so i told you about all saints day how you know it's become a vacation in france and really it's honoring our ancestors so here is a little uh, altar that tejo is going to recognize that i brought back um from japan and is still with me, you know, where you put uh, pictures of your loved ones. Here is another one. And in Japan, you find that altar in the kitchen. And very often, you know, the woman in the family will just do this, bow, talk to the ancestor. Yeah, you know, uncle so-and-so, you were a good scholar and you were great at reading. Would you please help? our uh, great grandson because it's the time of his exams finished it was very simple but part of everyday life prayers so rituals writing poetry music songs dance qigong yoga i saw somebody do a yin yoga to honor ancestors i thought what a great idea so we can reinvent our rituals you know, wherever we are. And of course, if there are some that we can partake of, that's great. But we can also create our own because our grief is very individual and very personal. So November is also a month of friendship of love. And, you know, Thanksgiving should be that, even though it's a source of, of conflict. Meaning it's a month to cultivate our external and internal resistance. So because it's getting cold, of course, family and community to help each other going through, we need to activate internal protection in a communal, communal space, which is not easy, as we all know. So all the problems that come with proximity, intimacy, and distance, feeling uncomfortable being too close, but not wanting to be too far. All of that is really activated during the fall. That's one of the challenges of fall and winter too, but it's coming up a lot in the fall with lung issues. What is distance? What is a proper distance, emotional distance? Not to be indifferent, but not to lose oneself it's a time of meeting our ghosts and dead leaves you know often we use the image of the lotus which is a very beautiful oriental image however 
we also have our dead leaves and the compost. It's the same image. It's a fall image of the, but it's a rougher image because it's, you know, decomposition with the lotus, you don't see it. It's underneath, it's in the, you know, it's very deep. With dead leaves, it's happening right there, you know, in the, but how we transform how can we transform that challenge of the months like the chrysanthemum and find the everyday sacred sacredness of the fall, which is gives us it's a demanding truth because it has the bearing of impermanence. It's inscribed in it. And I'm mentioning Rumi, the poet, who said, Our wounds are the openings through which light enters, is uncertainly a teaching for the fall and winter. It has an enormous potential of transformation, connection and exploration of the invisible, including our invisible. Like I know again through my little dog, I suddenly remembered another dog that I had a long time ago and had kind of neglected in my mind. And so when I'm honoring this present little dog who gave me so much, I'm also honoring the other one. So we all have our ghosts in some ways. And the silent blessing of grayness, fall and falling leaves, as well as the soft light, that's also part of the fall. So in order to have an intimate resonance with the season, we can certainly trust the teachings of the spirits of plants, animals, and earth. And if we espouse through observation and through what happens, we espouse the spirit of the season truly. And, you know, when it, it can be quite difficult and demanding, and it's also uh, a meeting with the invisible around us and in us. And here we go. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Phew, lots to think about. <laughs> um, we only have a few minutes, so maybe we should just give back the merit and enter the fog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. May the merit of this practice may, may the merit of this practice, practice benefit all beings. Benefit, benefit, all, benefit beings. all beings and bring peace. And, and bring peace. Thank you. You're welcome. And of course, I didn't say much about Thanksgiving because we don't have Thanksgiving in France. So, <laughs> except Black Friday, we do have Black Friday. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> yeah. So, have a good okay, blessings to all of you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.